morning. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us at uh, the show. Can I tell you something? So today we have a very special guest with us from Canada. Uh, he's Mr. Mark Emery, also known as the Prince of Pot, and he's been advocating for cannabis for many years. Uh, he's also the founder of Cannabis Culture. So uh, today I would like him to, uh, you know, I would like to invite him to share a little bit about his history and, you know, a few details about what's going on in Canada and globally from his eyes. So, uh, Mr. Mark Embry, thank you for joining us today. Greetings from Toronto, Karish. Yes, greetings. So, uh, before we get started, Seval, could, we, could you please share a little bit of, um, you know, your history and your journey from, for bringing, uh, you know, all the way from the day you started and to legalization of cannabis in Canada, 2008. Okay. I started smoking cannabis on December 21st, 1980, uh, which will be 40 years ago this December. And, but I didn't really do any activism. I was an activist at the time in a variety of things, but I didn't take uh, my turn uh, dealing with cannabis activism until 1989. And since then, I have been arrested and jailed, sorry, jailed and I've been arrested multiple, 40 some odd times, but I've been in 39 prisons and jails, at least one in every province in Canada and six states of the United States. Um, I've done over six years in total in prisons, including five years in the US. And uh, I published Cannabis Culture Magazine. We started the first video Cannabis Network Pot TV in January 2000. And uh, we have run political parties here in Canada, the BC Marijuana Party, the Canadian Marijuana Party. And uh, we have trailblazed and pioneered much of the activity in Canada. I was the world's most prominent seed seller. It was illegal. And yeah. that's why I did, five, I did five years in the United States federal prisons for sending cannabis seeds to Americans by the mail, uh, three million of them, mind you. So it was a fair bit over a 10 year period. And we were the largest sponsor of cannabis uh, rallies, activities, conventions, expos for almost 10 years from 1995 to the year 2005. And so um, I have quite a storied and colorful career um, mm -hmm. involving many prisons, many arrests, um, and I've been very happy throughout all of it. And so uh, I even have been writing my memoirs. So I've got some lovely, colorful stories of my time in jail. And uh, fortunately, I managed to meet some Malaysian activists. Um, I used to refer to her as Yuki Setsuna. Um, you know her, of course, Harish. Uh, her yes, name sir. in Malay, her, her birth name in Malaysia is different. But yeah, I it's uh, Intan. Yeah, her name yes. is Intan Mustika. Yes, and I did know that, but I always used to meet her. I met her through Facebook, so I always had her Facebook name. And I loved yeah. her and admired her very much. And it's, if anything, it's perhaps the loss of life I'm the most saddest about of all the activists I have known. Yes, that's true. It was a beautiful so, day. I met, I met you also in, uh, at the festival in Bangkok, Thailand in yes. 2016. And yes. uh, it was a wonderful time meeting all the Malaysian activists. Yes, I see that that was one of the uh, the first time I've ever met you uh, in uh, 2016. Uh, you know when when we did the talk on in Thailand, Bangkok with Highland. You know it was yes. an honor to meet you. Uh, you know we've always heard stories about you. We've always uh, you know read about cannabis culture and things like that, but. You know, to be able to meet you on that day with uh, Puan Yuki was an amazing experience as well. It was. And so much good things have happened in Thailand since that time. And in fact, of course, as you'll remember, at the festival, they had 100 uh, soldiers and policemen of the authorities there, specifically to tell them not to let me speak on the stage or to speak to the television. But yeah. nonetheless, nonetheless, uh, tremendous progress was made. Uh, when I was there, they, the Minister of Indigenous Medicine was announcing, uh, you know, the trials into medical cannabis. And of course, now it's progressed quite a bit. And uh, Thailand, to me, is being very hopeful. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, they've, take, they've actually came a long way since we, we've uh, been there in 2016. Now they've legalized 
medical cannabis use. Uh, you know, yes. hemp is have always always been there. The same thing in India. India has also uh, you know allowed for cannabis products to be sold over the counter as uh, Ayurveda Ayurvedic pro- products, which is tradi- traditional medicine. Yes. So, well, when yeah. I lived in India, I lived in India in 1992, and I remember buying uh, a kilo from my Ayurvedic uh, masseuse. Um, oh, okay. He, he had access. It was uh, 500, uh, I think maybe 400 US dollars for a kilo. And okay. uh, needless to say, when I was in Malaysia, I lived in Malaysia six months in 1993 in Borneo and Peninsular Malaysia. and. Uh, Marijuana was so much more challenging and difficult to find. Yeah, that's true. India has, I mean, India has been uh, used to cannabis for many years, not like Malaysia. Yes. Malaysia yeah. So, okay, uh, so be, be, before we, we have another more, three more questions uh, I would like to ask you actually. So uh, the second question, I mean, just now we just covered your, your history and, and journey to legalization in Canada, right? So Canada what? itself is not, foreign to cannabis, right? I mean, you've been involved with cannabis since the 90s. So, I'm a, so yes, yeah. 1990. Okay, so since 1990, uh, what, what type of uh, advancement has uh, Canada made in like in sense of technology? I remember once in 2016, you, you were speaking about how supposed stories can help with, uh, you know, cancer patients to help them re- relieve pain. And, you know, it's a, it's a most effective way to deliver TAC into the body. So, you know, yes. what, what is, yeah, what is the, the technology like in, in Canada in terms of medical cannabis and also hemp? Well, with, there's a tremendous amount of uh, hemp being grown for seeds largely though. We don't usually process the fiber in Canada because we don't have the, the industrial infrastructure to process it at this time. In the United States, however, they're going to be more advanced because hemp's legal now in all 50 states. And, uh, but in Canada, we have huge quantities of THC cannabis, legal and free market. Uh, the majority of cannabis consumed and sold and cultivated in Canada is still outside the legal regulated regime. Uh, the legalization regime that Canada got is terrible. It excludes virtually every single person who helped make it legal, uh, all the traditional growers and everybody who is, say, growing illegally is really quite prohibited from the legal market. Uh, I'll give you an example. I opened a, a store uh, to sell cannabis in Toronto in September 2016. Mm-hmm. And actually, I had no money at the time, so I borrowed $42,000, and I opened up a store, and I spent $24,000 Canadian dollars on three months' rent, $15,000 on cannabis, and $2,000 to renovate it. And in the next seven months, I did $7 million in sales. So wow. with just $15,000 in cannabis, rapidly turning it over became a total of $7 million in seven months. And, and I'm well known and I did have the most successful shop in Canada probably, but that's the reason I say that is to demonstrate how any ordinary normal person could simply open up a store and find it very popular. But what the government has now done is decided that you must have at least half a million dollars to start a legal shop. They want you to have $300,000 for inventory $150,000 for renovations, $50,000 for rents and what have you. And so what it has done is they have compelled, uh, they have given licenses largely to people who are corporate carpetbaggers, really, just people who have nothing to do with cannabis, who simply have a lot of money, who want mm-hmm. to make money. And all the people who help make it legal, the growers, the retailers, the sellers, the dealers, they're all excluded from the process. If you have a criminal record, it's very difficult to be in a growing facility, a retail facility. It's impossible to own a growing facility, a legal one or a legal retail facility. So the government decided that they would take a bit of revenge on the very culture that made it legal by excluding us and giving it to the bastards that we all hated. There are at least 45 corporations legal cannabis corporations 
that have a policeman on the board of directors or a former drug officer or a former prime minister or a former premier or a former member of parliament or a chief of police. And, and so what's happened is all the people who we hated and who persecuted mm -hmm. us are now on the boards of directors and directing these so-called legal companies. And of course, many aspects uh, of the legal regime are terrible, largely due to the regulations. For example, um, I'll show you something. Um, I'm gonna go to my kitchen okay. and I'm gonna show you a free market beverage. Okay. Uh, a free market beverage. Um, it's a can that should be in my fridge here somewhere. Ah, yes, here it is. Okay. This is a Nine Lives root beer. It has 300 milligrams, 300 milligrams of THC. Okay. Well, let me tell you, the legal limit for a beverage is 10. So this can that I showed you, which you buy on the free market, uh, probably for about uh, 10, $15 Canadian. Um, okay the limit legally is 10 milligrams. So this is 30 times the legal limit. So if you drink this, you will definitely fall asleep or get really high or what have you. But with the government's limit of 10 milligrams of THC in any packaged edible or beverage or what have you, it's doomed the entire industry because no one gets high on 10 milligrams or even 20 or 30 milligrams. The average person to sleep needs 80 to 150 milligrams. So, you know, you'll, you'll either get diabetes by eating so many cookies, brownies, candies, or beverages in order to get the necessary dose. And if you're medical, you would require a beverage possibly to have 500 milligrams. You'd need to drink 50 beverages out of the government shop in order mm -hmm. to achieve what one can will do here. And it's all about money. It's all about control. It's all about controlling the cannabis consumer as well as controlling the industries that provide it and giving lots of work to bureaucrats, uh, to policemen, to cops. Everybody who shouldn't be in the equation is in fact in control of the legalization. And the cannabis farmer and the cannabis consumer have virtually no control uh, of anything in the legal industry. So unfortunately, it turned out to be a terrible thing and that's the danger. It, it's different in Malaysia. I mean, Malaysia had the death penalty for cannabis. So, you know, any improvement you guys have is going to be better than the death penalty. But here, um, the situation previous to legalization was greatly better uh, for the consumer, for the grower, for the distributor, for the dealer. And the legal situation, uh, even the corporations that started all these companies are so terribly regulated and in track, attracted such bad people in the first place that many of them are collapsing. So we have a collapsing legal industry. We have an overtaxed, overregulated, police infiltrated industry. And we're all very disappointed. There is one good thing in Ontario, where I'm from, is that you may not be able to stand beside another human being legally. We all have to stay six feet away from each other uh, okay. or else we'll get charged but you can smoke cannabis anywhere on the streets now. Uh, you can smoke it on the street. You can carry it around with you on your person. Uh, when I come out of the stadium watching the baseball game, which I don't know when I'll be able to do that again, but when I come out of the baseball game, I can light up a joint right away. And even though the policeman is right there directing traffic, they don't even look anymore. So that's good. The police on the street are very much used to people smoking cannabis and saying nothing and do nothing. And that's the only visible improvement. The rest of it is not an improvement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's uh, our yeah. situation. And here's the thing. Uh, the medical people are no better served now than they were five years ago. We know a lot more information, but the fact is there are still no cannabis cancer clinics where if you have cancer, you can go in and get someone to give you a regimen of cannabis oil concentrates, I would recommend in a suppository form in order to cure your cancer or certainly to extend your life. Uh, it hasn't gotten nearly sophisticated enough for my liking. When I was in Slovenia in 2016, uh, I learned about cannabis and using suppositories to address the cancers of the organs, uh, livers, pancreas, lungs, 
you know, mm -hmm. stomach, uh, lower intestines, bowels, uh, colitis, prostate, or sorry, mm -hmm. colon and prostate. These areas are best served by taking huge doses of uh, pure cannabis oil, full spectrum, through uh, a suppository. And the reason being is other methods are inefficient. Smoking destroys half of the THC during the combustion. Uh, your stomach acids destroy a good chunk of the THC uh, and cannabinoids in your stomach acids. Whereas when you uh, use it through a mucous membrane, and we have five or six areas of mucous membranes, our mouth, our nose, our eyes, our anus, uh, and our penis, and a vagina, um, mm -hmm. those are very absorbent tissues. And uh, the most efficient use of the, for the body is taking TH3 through uh, cocoa butter suppositories. So if anybody ever wants to know exactly how to do that, I can give them the formula. It's very easy to make suppositories. Uh, it's not difficult. Um, you just need access to cannabis oil, which probably is still problematic in Malaysia, I bet. Yes, yes, that's true. Uh, if, even CBD medicine is still difficult to get in Malaysia. You know, we Strangely have a lot enough, of patients. That, yeah. that's, CBD is only legal in authorized outlets in Canada, which is very frustrating because a lot of mainstream businesses now are putting CBD in things in the United States, yogurt, milk, bread, as well as yeah. just out and out supplements. But in Canada, they still have to be sold through legal outlets and the dosages uh, are, are underwhelming to be of any use in the, in the legal stores. In the free market stores, uh, free market outlets, you can buy CBD or THC in any strength you want. Like I said, this beverage is available. It is 30 times what the regulated legal industry allows you to buy. And yet yeah. somebody who's medical would need one of these every day, minimum. Yeah, actually, thank you for sharing all of that. Uh, you know, I, I, I realized that, you know, when people, when the government uh, make use, they take control. I mean, like what you shared earlier, you know, they try to mon manipulize, monopolize the whole industry, uh, giving to certain people that they feel fit, uh, for it and you know they neglected the people who fight for it and everything that has uh, you know well, all the growers like in Canada I'm very sure uh, you know there's a lot of movies made about Canada you've been growing cannabis <laughs> for many years and uh, you know you have history of using it uh, you know as a as a medicine as a recreational drug uh, you know so you know like you were saying like suppos suppositories and everything that came from Slovenia was during it was is uh, it was illegal. I mean, when the plant was illegal, yeah, was still so illegal in Slovenia. Yeah, but there was so much of uh, advancement made, even though it's illegal. But right now in Canada, even though it's legal, because there, of all there, the there are no. The irony is, in where it's legal, there are no advancements. There's not any increased science. There is no better medical delivery. All the great inventions of the cannabis culture were developed during the free market prohibition period. In other words, when it was illegal, we made enormous strides. And we made these strides despite government. The biggest thing I failed to anticipate was by asking the government to legalize it, you are asking them to regulate it. And government never regulates it to the best benefit of citizens. They regulate it to the best benefit of the insiders to whom they are intimately connected with. So we talk about bureaucrats who influence government policy. We talk about the police who always have a stranglehold on government policies related to drugs and weapons and uh, social behavior. Uh, the government obligated itself to former politicians who saw they could make money and would be invited on the boards of directors of these companies. And then we have the corporate carpetbaggers who have no morality other than just to make money and allegedly serve the marketplace. But the marketplace has been so artificially uh, ruined and, and corrupted that these legal companies cannot appeal to the marketplace. Um, the regulations are terrible. The people who make up these companies are terrible. The way they were structured and allowed in legally is terrible. And of course, everybody who was once an activist who made it, who had a hand in making something legal, for example, myself, are all prohibited from the marketplace. I cannot own a, a cannabis growing company. I can't own a store. I can't uh, occupy a position of responsibility in any of these companies. Uh, I am completely excluded, even though I probably have more uh, responsibility for Canada legalizing cannabis than any other citizen in Canada. Um, 
So to, to me, it's a very unhappy situation. Um, they did a better job in Colorado, but America has many of the same problems in California. Uh, the, num the, the people who are limited, that can't open a shop, can't open a cultivation facility, um, who require too much money from the state in order to start. Um, our enemy has always been the government, and it is still the government. <laughs> I think, I think the government has to learn that, you know, uh, technology and advancement and the best thing for the citizen is actually to open up uh, access for the public to be able to be involved in the industry and also to lower the prices of being but involved in everything. That's true with everything. A every endeavor of human activity should be open to the general public to participate in. But you'll find that's not the case. You and I can't have a lumber company. We can't have a mining company. We can't grow crops or produce. It's even hard to open a business. It's so thoroughly regulated by government to exclude ordinary people. Because the last thing governments really want to do is empower the ordinary citizen. What they want is to keep us in slavery as a vassal, a serf, serving uh, as a minion, serving their controllable assets like corporations and governments and institutions. So the citizen is always the last thought of any government. And government's don't even know what it's like to be a citizen really and they don't pass legislation giving us freedom that's impossible legislation only takes away our freedom it never gives it to us freedom is something we have to begin with and then government spends our entire life taking it away from us in various ways this covid 19 hysteria is all about taking away our freedom i'm like literally under house arrest for 60 days now in, in Canada, I can't go and be with people. I can't go into a store. I can't go to a park. I can't go to work. I can't go to my own work. I can't go to your work. I, you know, I can't go to see my mother on Mother's Day. Um, I can't see an elderly person in an in a, in a elderly care home. I, I'm, I'm virtually unable to do anything but watch the propaganda on television tell me to stay home. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of things going on around the world and, you know, sometimes there's things that influence well, our daily lives know, we're as gonna well. See, we're going to see terrible poverty. We're going to see prostitution in the millions. We're going to see depression, hopelessness, suicides, um, a, an economic malaise that will last years because of this. And we're going to see some revolutions and a lot of food riots and a lot of people very upset. And a lot of these politicians who are bathing in this power now they're going to be executed in the years ahead by huge mobs of angry civilians uh, who are going to blame them quite correctly for this disaster. Well, okay. That, that is definitely a very uh, deep insight of what could happen, but that's true. You know, we, anything could happen in this type of situation when uh, a pandemic is, uh, we are facing a pandemic. But so, I don't you know, buy that. Realization. That pandemic that thing, it, we are facing a virus. Mm -hmm. Right, but we cannot close down society every time we get a virus. We're going to get them year after year. They're going to keep coming. We live in a society, a world filled with bacteria and viruses and what have you. When I was in prison, I got MRSA, and penicillin doesn't work on me, so I'm an immunocompromised person. But nonetheless, life goes on, and should I get something that kills me? That's what happens. You know, you you don't get a guarantee in life. You get an an opportunity in life to do what you can with it, to live your best life. And then if the Green Reaper comes and says, it's your time, you got to go. I mean, it's sad and what have you, but it's not tragic when old people die and COVID by and large kills the elderly and the vulnerable. It's not a tragedy. It's an inevitability. Whereas if someone five or 10 or 15 or 20 years old died, now that's tragic because they were denied the full enjoyment of their life. But by the time you're my age at 62 or 65 or 70, you can't complain. Uh, you know, 100 years ago, the average person never even got that far and certainly didn't enjoy life like we have. I've had unprecedented good economic times to grow up in. I never saw a depression. We never went to war. We didn't have yeah. to face a, a pandemic like 1919. My father and mother suffered egregiously far more than I have ever suffered in my life. And that's what everybody in my generation has to admit. So this idea that somehow they should be, we should freeze the, the whole world, especially the world of young people who can't, the likelihood of them suffering badly is very remote um, mm -hmm. compared to say the elderly over 70. 
um, this is a terribly self-centered way to look at life. And I look at it that I could go at any time. I could get killed on the street. I could pick up any number of bacteria or germs that would kill me. I might even have a predisposition genetically that's going to kill me tomorrow, but I'm unaware of it, right? I mean, all these possibilities exist, and I, we can't burden other people because I have a vulnerability to some aspect of existence. Yeah, that's true. But, but, it, but so, when I say that on Facebook or Twitter, hundreds of people you know, call me bad names and say I'm irresponsible, self-centered, negligent, and all sorts of other things. You know, what about grandma? What about grandma? I mean, well, you know. <laughs> but, you know, uh, you know, we have to face what, we, you know, what we're going through with the best uh, set of mind that we can have, right? So I think, it's, you know, your opinion and your, your, your position on this is, is fair because, you know, that's the truth. We do, we do face a lot of things, uh, you know, when our elderly, I mean, face way more than all of us, uh, you know, going through the, the depression period and, and, and all of this. So, but and anyway. World War II and all these terrible things our parents had to get through. Yeah, right? that's true. Um, by, so, let, me, let me ask you a question. How are things in Malaysia? You know, when I, oh, was well. there, when I was there, of course, it was the death penalty. I remember when I was in KL and I passed the prison there, they had painted on the walls of the side of the prison, drugs mean death, you know, with like a hangman's <laughs> Beside yeah, the, the, it is it's actually loosened up since uh, the previous government uh, came into power, the Pakatan Harapan. So they decided to end all uh, what they call uh, hang to death, even for for murder cases or any other cases. You oh, know, so you you towards, abolish capital punishment? Yeah, it was more towards a hum, human humanitarian approach, humanitarian approach because uh, you know people are saying it's not effective to kill somebody rather than, uh, you know, trying to help them improve and become better people in the society. Well, that's so, good to hear. Yeah, so, uh, but they still are giving life imprisonment. That's the, that's the problem. So anybody yeah. who has uh, 200 grams of and above, they can, they, are, they will be sentenced for life imprisonment. Or oh, my. I need, to so smoke, they, well, I need to smoke they, that every couple of days. Yeah, <laughs> and, and the thing is, they, they, they haven't really abolished completely the death penalty. They have uh, actually given, uh, uh, loosened it up and say that the judge can choose either death penalty or life imprisonment. So the is judge Dr. has Luka, to... Is Dr. Yeah. Lukaman still in prison? No, uh, Lukman, Lukman is still in prison, yes. And Dr. Ganja is uh, Captain Amaruddin. He, he's, uh, there's two people, actually. Um, so, what are the prospects for them? Well, uh, we, we, they are still uh, in court hearing. And uh, like Dr. Gan Dr. Ganja, or Captain Amaruddin, he was caught because uh, they found ham plants in his, in his uh, home. So his case is a bit different because there's no TAC in the plants. Uh, oh. Lukman, yeah, Lukman, uh, you know, he's caught uh, with TAC products. So, uh, you know, the, the case is still ongoing uh, because of the advancement of cannabis all over the world. Uh, you know, people are, you know, the government and the, the, the government is looking into loosening the laws, but they're not sure because they're still afraid. There's still stigma attached with cannabis, which we need to end. So, you know, like the talks that we do today, you know, it's a great way for us to educate the public in Malaysia uh, about cannabis. Yeah. <laughs> so, so keep one talking. Thing, keep talking. Yeah, one, one thing I like to uh, move on to, to another two more questions is, uh, what can we learn from your travels? Uh, you know, like you've been all over the world. You've seen many countries who, uh, you know, have cannabis legally and illegally. Uh, but now in the 2020, when there's a lot of countries who have legalized cannabis use medically and also recreationally, uh, what do you think? Uh, was but, the best but I'm going to tell reference? you that the legalization generally almost everywhere is a scam. Because mm -hmm. even when the courts declare cannabis legal, the police and politicians will manipulate that court decision to reinstate a degree of prohibition. So wherever you, for example, I'll give you an example. They, in Colombia, everyone can grow 19 plants. So to that degree, Colombia is almost completely legal because if you can grow 19 plants, that's enough, you know, every, if you can grow 19 plants every three months, you'll never be short of cannabis. So that, that's great, but when they legalized it for export or production, all these people have spent a lot of money on licenses, 
and have tried to make it uh, grow. They've grown a lot of plants, but the government hasn't signed any deals that allow anybody to sell it. So many of them are going bankrupt because they spent all this money, grew all this cannabis, and cannot legally distribute it in Colombia or South America or anywhere in the world. So um, unfortunately, they've been misled by these promises and now they've committed a lot of money and they are in big trouble. And this is true in many places. From my travels, I'll tell you, the best situations are in Uruguay. The, Uruguay is the best situation. Everybody in Uruguay can grow six enormous plants. They can belong to any club. Um, and that club uh, can grow, sell them 40 grams every month, but they sell them for $3 two to three dollars US a gram, which is an incredibly good price, the best price yeah. in the world generally. And you can belong to as many clubs as you want. You can start your own club. The ordinary person in Uruguay can start their own club, can grow cannabis indoors or outdoors. It's the best system, the most egalitarian fair system anywhere in the world um, because no one is excluded. Uh, okay. No one, no one is it's there's nothing that makes you have to go to the government or or big corporations or anything like that so uruguay is the best situation um okay. and whenever you have a good situation the price should be cheap um i will tell you this in canada you can get a kilo of decent cannabis for 2000 Canadian dollars a kilo. That's a, that's a great deal. That's as low as price as it's ever been in 40 years, probably. Um, because we have a huge glut of cannabis in Canada. When cannabis was made legal, and this is one of the other problems. When cannabis was made legal, the free market had already been supplying that demand for the last 40, 50 years. And with, you know, cannabis still gets good money. So whatever demand there was, it was met by the free market or the illegal market, you might say. Um, but when they legalize cannabis, legalized in quotes, and these big factory farms with their soulless football field size stadium growing circumstances started cranking out hundreds of thousands of plants, there was no actual demand for them. So when all that legal cannabis came on the market with all the illegal cannabis, the free market cannabis on the market, it caused a huge glut. There's way more cannabis than there is a demand in Canada. So the price legally uh, has come down a little bit, but the price on the free market has plummeted. So that has made things even more difficult for the legal industry because they're, they have five taxes on top, a producer tax, an excise tax, the sales tax provincially, the sales tax federally, and in Manitoba, a social responsibility tax to help mm -hmm. pay for all the bad things that will happen now that marijuana is legal. Uh, of course, <laughs> nothing, nothing bad happened, because it's just a ripoff. But you know, all taxes are a ripoff of sorts. So, um, but see, that's the problem, the, uh, the legal industry, uh, has had the price drop a little, but the illegal industries had the price drop a lot. So that's put even more pressure on these legal companies, all of whom are losing money. Not a single legal company is making any money. Now you'd have to ask yourself, wow, how bad has it gotten when you can't make money producing cannabis? And to me, that's the indictment against Canada's legal regime, is that everybody is making less money or no money. Um, the government is making a fortune in taxes. The government hired thousands of new bureaucrats. They hired thousands of new police. So who are the winners of legalization? Not the cannabis consumer, not the cannabis producers, but the people who are always against cannabis, the police, the bureaucrats, the health officials, the politicians, the government. Those five groups have all made tremendous amounts of money and they are the true profiteers of the legalization. And I suspect that's gonna be the case everywhere in the world. So okay. my advice is not to legalize cannabis, but to stop arresting people for cannabis and let us come up with our own rules. We can set our own rules. We do not need the same governments that harassed and hounded us for 80 years and put us in jail 
those people are not morally qualified to set the rules for our culture, our industry, our people, our citizens. We're yeah. qualified to do that because we've done the suffering and we've done the growing and we do the consuming and we're the people that love cannabis. The government still hates cannabis. For all the talk about legalizing, they still hold us in contempt. They still hold the cannabis plant in contempt. They still regard it as a negative vice similar or akin to alcohol and tobacco. And so they will always have a condescending approach to us at the best. At the worst, they will have a prohibitionary, uh, exploitative, uh, separatist, apartheid approach to it, meaning we're so bad a culture that we have to be kept from all other cultures, children and good people and what have you, right? So to that degree, um, it's a further reminder uh, we can never trust the government even uh, when they must legalize it they will lie and they will have their own agenda which will not be our agenda let me tell you and the problem is there are uh, collaborators in, in our culture who will go along with this because they think it's progress or more importantly a lot of people in the free market are looking for a job a guaranteed government style job that lasts forever that pays decently and so a lot of people uh, want legalization so they can become some kind of corporate middle management lackey stooge minion um, taking orders from some corporate scumbag who's taking orders from some Health Canada scumbag. So um, basically, you've got a lot of people who don't really want to take a chance and grow cannabis uh, illegally on the free market and risk going to jail and perhaps losing children, money, assets, property, any number of negative consequences and so they seek out the comfort of something legal so they can have a job in Canada but none of these legal jobs are nice uh, working in their corporate factory farms is a soulless horrible thing and they pay minimum wage so mo many Canadians will not work in those legal factories so they bring in workers from Mexico and Africa and Europe and the Caribbean and Latin America who will work for the lowest possible wage, live in a, a box just off the factory farm property and send all their money back home. And I get that. I mean, that's a very honorable, noble thing for these Mexicans or Latins to do. But consequently, these people were promising Canadians all these jobs if we legalize it. And what was really true is that when it was illegal, they were all Canadian. The illegal Canadian cannabis industry was totally Canadian from beginning to end. The growers were Canadian, the sellers were Canadian, the smugglers, everybody, the retailers, guys like me, we we're all Canadian, right? Well, now they have foreigners investing the capital. They have foreigners building the factory farms. They have imported migrant workers from Mexico and places of poverty brought in to live in concentrated conditions um, and growing the cannabis under soulless conditions, right? I've seen over yeah. 600 uh, gardens in my life, growing garden. I've seen vast fields. I've seen corporate legal ones. I've seen illegal ones. I've seen them in, in 35 different countries. I've been to Morocco and seen millions of plants in one day, all right, because all of Kitama is, is planted. And I will tell you, I have never seen anything as soul discouraging as a Canadian factory farm. I've never seen anything else as horrible, as monotonous, as grating as the environments that those are. Every, okay. I, you know, normally I feel awesome going into someone's garden. If you've got 20, 30 plants that you love and you can tell me the story about each one of them and how you grew it and what nutrients were, that's a beautiful experience. But when you go to these factory farms and somebody says, all 10,000 plants are identical, they're grown identically, we use these kind of chemicals and this kind of system under these intense bright lights, you're going, Jesus Christ, I've gone to hell. I've gone to cannabis hell. This is it. When our okay. entire culture gets, sub, uh, gets summed up as a commodity. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Mark. So we only have about like uh, another five minutes to go. So, Thanks for letting me rant, by the way. No problem. No problem. I think what you shared is, is uh, very important. Uh, you know, if the, the cannabis uh, industry can actually help with the, con the country's economy, uh, it can help with uh, breaking the B40 group. Below 40 in Malaysia means the group of uh, families who earn less than 3,000 ringgit in their homes. So, you know, it's a, it's a great way for them to increase the income if they were allowed Just so to you know, their homes. that's really yeah. propaganda. Yeah. In fact, we don't know. We just don't know. 
the thing is, governments just get the fuck away from our culture. First of all, no culture that's been persecuted for 50 to 100 years should ever have the same people who oppress and persecuting us making the rules for our culture. Because ultimately, that's the exact same thing. That's just prohibition under different names. But if the okay. people who arrested us and gave us the death penalty are now threatening to arrest us and put us in jail if we don't have a license or we don't have permission or we don't grow it their way or the right way, then it's still the same fucking thing. So we shouldn't let yep. them off the hook. They should stop mm -hmm. arresting us no matter what we do that involves cannabis. We, could, we should be able to grow one plant or a hundred plants or a thousand plants and it's nobody's business because nobody is hurt by the growing of cannabis. Nobody gets hurt when cannabis is sold. Nobody is, we don't, we're not socially bad people. We don't hurt society. Not like alcohol, which is everywhere in the world and dangerous drugs and all these prescription drugs. Yes. If Malaysia has a drug problem, it's probably your prescription drug problem. Yes, right? I, gotta be, I gotta believe Malaysia has a big C and that's the real problem. I mean, who's doing that? Who makes all those drugs? Those are big Chinese and Malaysian and Western companies cranking out these chemicals and getting them on your black markets to poison people because they don't have better alternatives. We should be growing okay. magic mushrooms, cannabis, yeah. all these organic that's products, it. even opium. We should let people just get raw opium. You know, like a poppy head in a tea will be as good as an aspirin if you've got, you know, this is what we should be returning to. In other words, giving the people the freedom they deserve because plants belong to people. They don't belong to the state. They don't belong to the church. They belong to, and if you're a Christian or a Muslim, both books tell you that God put these here on this earth for the use of each individual citizen, each one of God's children. So these aren't things that the state has ever been assign the responsibility for. They have usurped it from us as a way of social control and we need to take it back. And letting okay. them set the terms of our legalization is not taking back our culture. Okay. So, okay, Mr. Mark, uh, is there any final thing you'd like to say, like any quote or, uh, you know, like your vision for yeah, 2025? Yeah, I can't wait to get, can't, well, I can't wait to get back to Malaysia. I, I, it'll be interesting to see if I'm even allowed in. Um, <laughs> I know when I went to Thailand, they, okay. they, they, they let me in, but then they restricted the activities I could do. But that's fair enough. They were at least upfront about it. And of course, you know the Thai, they're always very pleasant, friendly as fascism anywhere. Um, yep. So, uh, but I hope I meet you again soon, Arish. I wish you the best on your books. And uh, I, I hope a lot of people see this show. I can't wait to come back. And I miss my old friend, uh, Yuki Satsuna, so, so much. What a beautiful woman, great activist. Um, the biggest loss I can cite in my entire career. And I knew everybody, Jack Rare, uh, Dennis Perone, and they're all wonderful people. But man, I really miss Yuki. Okay. Yes, we all miss her dearly because and she's a great motivation for us every single day. So thank you, uh, Mr. Mark, uh, for, yes. for spending this much time uh, with us and just giving such very wonderful insights about cannabis and how is the situation all over the world. So, okay, uh, so thank you very much. And guys, I hope lots of people see it. Let me know what they think. Yeah, definitely. So guys, uh, for those of you watching, if you have anything, any questions, just drop it in the comment section below and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. So good day and see you.